Um, it is quite obvious that how a person views the church in relationship to Israel is a key issue. It really is. Okay. And so what we're going to do now at the bottom of page 23 and all of 24 and in 25 is to address, I think, the key components of the study of Israel and the church. And you always start with word studies. Okay. Um, I don't even know whether it's necessary for us to look up all these references, but let's just run through A, B, C, D, and E under Israel. Here are the various meanings of the word Israel in the Bible. There is at least one place where the name, where the word Israel is actually a man's name. Right? Thou shalt no more be called Jacob, but thou shalt be called Israel, God said to Jacob. Alright? So, in, at least in that instance, it was a man's name. Secondly, in Isaiah 49 verse 3, uh, the prophet makes a reference to to Israel, and in the context of Isaiah 49, the whole 49th chapter is about Christ. He calls Isaiah calls the Messiah God's Israel, and and the name is significant because the name means uh, having power with God, one who fights for God. You see, and so uh, the Messiah is going to be a fighter. He's going to come back with power and glory and judgment with his armies. Okay? There's a third meaning for the name Israel, for the word Israel in page 24. Many references throughout the, the Old Testament use the term, the term Israel refers to the whole Hebrew nation, just as a totality. Uh, Israel went into bondage. Right? Israel was captivated. Okay? Uh, sometimes you have references to the whole house of Israel, right? Sometimes the house of Israel is distinguished from the house of Judah, right? And and so um, there is no question that Israel sometimes means the whole Jewish nation. We're not talking about the spiritual people in the nation either. We're talking about everybody, okay? Then let's look up a couple of these references. Uh, let's try Psalm seventy-three one which is another definition or meaning of the word, it's obvious that the word Israel sometimes refers merely and only to the truly spiritual members of the nation. It's the believing faithful remnant. Uh, Psalm 73, 1. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. What is the, ba what is the one word that describes Hebrew poetry? What is the one word that describes Hebrew poetry? All Hebrew poetry, almost without exception, is characterized by what characteristic? It starts with a P. Parallelism. Remember that? I don't know if you've ever read it or heard it, but Hebrew parallelism uh, refers to a whole, with all different kinds of parallelism, right? You have synonymous parallelism where the first statement is essentially the same as the second statement, and that's what we have here. The first statement is, truly God is good to Israel, right? And along the same vein of thought, this Israel that he refers to is even to such as are of a clean heart. Now, technically, this is uh, probably an example of syn uh, synthetic um, parallelism, where the first statement is not exactly identical to the second statement. Rather, the second statement builds on the first statement, right? He's not saying twice that God is good to Israel. He says it once. See? Then the next statement describes Israel. So it's, it's, it's giving additional details. Right? It's obvious that Israel then, in this context, are those who have a clean heart. Everybody see that? So Israel is saying with a clean heart? Right. Those with a clean heart. 
Isaiah 45, 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. Okay. Um, maybe we could even include verse 24, 25. Surely shall one say in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. He basically says the same thing. Okay? In other words, there is coming a point in Jewish history when all Israel will be spiritually saved. It's an everlasting salvation if he's talking about us. In this case, it's obviously not military. Right? It's obviously not a medical thing that he's talking about. Right? It's a spiritual thing. He's talking about everlasting salvation and justification. And, and glory in God. 44, 22, and that's something. 44.22? Okay. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant, I have formed thee, thou art my servant. O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud thy transgressions, and like a cloud thy sins return to me, for I have redeemed thee. Yeah. yeah. So those are more examples of the same use of the word. Does this not fit what we talked about in class the other day and, uh, when we read uh, Ezekiel chapter 20 where God repeatedly shows that he judges his people but someday the final judgment is he's going to bring them back to the land he's going to divide the wicked from the righteous he's going to kill the wicked Jews and the only Jews that are going to go into the land are the righteous. Right? They're going to be spiritually saved people. Okay? And so it's obvious that time and again, the ultimate fulfillments of the promises under the covenants to the nation Israel are actually only going to be fulfilled in the believing remnant, the real Israel. Not just national Israel in a generic sense, but only spiritual Israel. Okay? And lastly, um, the we won't look up this reference. After the Babylonian captivity, the name Israel was applied to those members of the tribe of Judah who had remained true to the house of David. Just the just a small portion of the nation was called Israel. <laughs> oh, now, what's what's the significance of these five points? In any discussion of any passage in the Bible where Israel is mentioned, nobody has a right to foist on it one particular meaning without questioning whether any of the other meanings might fit. See, because Israel has a variety of meanings, and so therefore context must determine what is being spoken of in any particular scripture. Follow? Actually, even though the physical was spiritual, but it, in meaning, spiritual meaning is different from mm -hmm. New Testament spiritual meaning. New Testament spiritual is just repeated that our soul are saved and going to heaven, but here is spiritual saved it is uh, actually on earth. On well, that's an interesting question. We're going to talk about it later in Hebrews 12. I think that Old Testament righteous Jews are in Abraham's bosom which is a place very much like heaven if it's not heaven paradise paradise but that is first Jesus Christ that he did a meal with heaven right and, and when Christ died he took paradise into heaven so I think that Old Testament righteous Jews are in heaven I think Abraham is in heaven yeah. right but for the people who are physically alive, 
again, we're getting beyond ourselves, but you know, for the people who are literally alive on Earth when these historical events, future events take place, it is those people that are going to experience the earthly dimension. You know, but anyway, we can talk about that another time. You'll notice that I put Galatians six sixteen under definition D. See that? I think that the truly spiritual members of the nation or the faith for the believing remnant is what Paul is referring to in Galatians 6.16. I think he's actually talking about believing Jews, the Israel of God. Okay? Now, I didn't, I didn't put that there. Merrill F. Unger put that there. That's my source. Okay, I got this from Unger's Bible Dictionary. Okay? Now, Unger was a dispensationalist and a premillennialist. Okay? Now, if I had used uh, Erdman's Bible Dictionary, well, you know, that's a different publisher, different theological stance. You know, they would very likely have placed Galatians 6.16 under maybe the church. <laughs> you know what I mean? See? But uh, at, <clears throat> at face value, I think that you can make a strong case for Galatians 6.16 being a reference to the believing Jews during the present age. We move to a discussion of the word church. Church in the Bible has a variety of meanings as well. A, there are a couple of examples where the word church refers to general assemblies of various groups of people. In Acts chapter 19, verse 39, Paul was at Ephesus, and um, they were having a big uh, holiday that day. It was a religious holiday. The worshippers of Diana, uh, and uh, and Paul preached against it, <laughs> and uh, so many people got saved that they started the business started to suffer. You know, because the whole <clears throat> economy was based on ma uh, manufacturing and selling little statues of the goddess Diana. And so the economic thing started to be affected, and uh, there was a big uproar, and a great mob of the citizens gathered together, and they're called an ecclesia, an ecclesia of the citizens gathered together. It's not a local church at all in the New Testament sense, but it is the same word, and a called out assembly, an assembly of people. There's one very interesting reference. Turn with me to Acts 7.38 where the word church is actually applied to the nation Israel. Let's read 37 38. In this chapter, Stephen is summarizing a whole chrono chronological list of Old Testament events about the nation Israel. And at this juncture, he says, This is that Moses who said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like me. Him shall you hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living oracles to give unto us. And then he continues on. This is obviously a reference to the assembly the assembled Jewish nation. You see? That's the idea. The assembled Jewish nation camping out at Mount Sinai where they received the law at Moses' hand. And he calls, this is the church in the wilderness. Okay? I'll, I'll reserve comments about that until we finish the other definitions. Another definition of the word church is that is B. Ecclesia refers specifically to the whole body of all believers of this present age from Pentecost to the first resurrection. First Corinthians fifteen fifty two um, talks about believers uh, living and dead being uh, brought into glory. They possess a spiritual organic unity based on the Holy Spirit's baptizing work. We're all placed into the body. Paul says when we believe. 1 Corinthians 12. It's a, the church is a mystical body. This church is a mystical body over which Christ is the spiritual head. Ephesians 1.22 God has set Christ in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and every other name that is named, and made him to be head over the church, which is his body. 
and you know we could just multiply descriptions of the of the universal church things that are true of the church you know they're going to be raptured in fact we're going to talk about it a little bit later in the lesson and so the church has a broad meaning very often in the new testament to refer to all believers of the present dispensation in Jesus Christ thirdly the word church sometimes has a more limited sense of the believers in a province or a city john wrote what seven letters to to the churches of Asia, and he addressed one church. Uh, I mean, Christ addressed one uh, letter to the church at Ephesus, to the angel of the church at Ephesus in, in this town and in that town and the other town. Okay, at that point in early church history, there probably weren't more than one congregation in some of these small towns. But even in the New Testament, when we come to Romans chapter sixteen. Uh, which is the the last definition of the church? There, the word church has even a more refined meaning than just the church in a particular town. It actually refers to a church in a particular section of the town. You see, it it, it often refers to the believers meeting in a specific house or other location for the distinctive functions of worship, evangelism, and ministry. In, in Romans chapter sixteen, Paul says. He, he greets the church in somebody's house, and he, you know, and the, and, the, and the church in this house, and the church in that house, you know, and he actually, I think there are about five local churches that Paul addresses specifically in the last chapter of Romans, and in Colossians chapter 4, Paul was writing from prison, and he says to Philemon to greet, uh, to make sure that this letter is read at the church of Laodicea, a neighboring town, right? as well as in, in the other churches, the local local groups, right? So again, just like the word Israel has a variety of meanings, so the word church in Scripture has a variety of meanings. Therefore, whenever we look at a specific passage of Scripture that refers either to the church or to Israel, we are obligated, we are really obligated to let the context dictate which of the meanings we uh, we put on that word? Okay. <clears throat> and what you will find, uh, this is this. I said I was going to come back to this. The Acts seven thirty eight reference, where Stephen refers to the church in the wilderness. It's wrong for dispensationalists to admit, to say that Israel is never called the church in the Bible. It's wrong for dispensationalists to say that the church is not Israel, or that Israel is not the church, because technically they're wrong. <laughs> Peter refers to Israel as a church. Okay, we have to acknowledge this example does in fact declare that Israel was a church. Okay? But that does not prove covenant theology as a system, if you understand what I mean. To admit that, yes, Israel is called a church, is not to, does not lead necessarily to the conclusion that the nation Israel is, has the same character, na nature, uh, history, functions, divine relationships, Spiritual experience, future, you know, uh, relationship to God, it does not equate the two at all. Because when you look at the details of the New Testament church, quote unquote, and compare it to the Israel, the church in the Old Testament, quote unquote. The meaning is actually is uh, yeah. understanding the yeah. uh, uh, You don't agree the dispensation and say the. Old Testament church concept just there's no any church concept in Old Testament. Technically, that's false. It's yeah. false. Yeah. Uh, we agree that in a sense a kind of church exists yeah. because they go to the paradise as Jesus Christ told uh, uh, the the righteous to go to the heaven uh, and paradise. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah, I know. My point is, but we must distinguish the different kind of church. Yeah. Yeah. 
There was a church in the Old Testament, if if we take Acts what seven. What's the word church there? Like it's the same word. It's the same word, but the context. Um, Scofield's got no here. The gathering out of citizens in the public place for a deliberation. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be seen as the church as we think. That's my point. We're, you can't make them synonymous, you know. Um, I wonder if I could think of a. So when people say there is no church, church is not Israel. They are using the word church as in the sense of the New Testament, not the word when the word church is used in this verse. Yeah. An analogy, if I could maybe try to draw one, is that uh, we're talking about uh, Chang has a car, and uh, and my son Nathan has a car. <laughs> you you have a car. My son Nathan has a car. Car. Uh, they're both cars, but if you compare them, they're they're very much different. They call the same thing, but they're just not the same. You have a, a real car with a real motor. My son has a dinky toy. You know, and it cannot transport people, and it has, it's just very different in character than your car. But also, similarity, they, Israel people, they chosen and select mm-hmm. and, and put out from the Egypt a bunch of people, and they make them as a God's people. Right. And we are, the church Christians also select and chose to right. withdraw from the dark world right. and put as my people. Right. Okay. I, we could list uh, probably 20 other similarities, Chang. And Schaefer does that at the beginning of his systematic theology. He he draws a whole list of similarities. You know, we're both God's people. We both have a kingdom relationship with God. God is, we have a, a covenant relationship with God. Um, our covenant relationship is essentially based on uh, unconditional election. Oh, where the knowing one of Jesus Christ is the head. Because they they drink the water of the wrath of the Jesus. Okay, there are, there's a mystical relationship with God through Christ, even if you want to say that, you know. But here's the point: the essential point, which, at which covenant theology fails, is that it's not enough to notice similarities, because the Bible gives us differences as well. There are differences, significant differences. And we cannot let the similarities lead us to the wrong conclusion that Israel is equal to the church, that it's the same thing, that this church in, therefore inherits all of Israel's promises, that they, they just go way too far when they make that conclusion because of the differences. And so in this lesson, what we are focusing on are the differences. You have to notice the differences. It's the differences that make all the difference, you see. And if there are differences that are really significant, then that justifies the conclusions of the dispensationalist. That if these differences are so profound, then that does not argue for a same program. It argues for a different program in the divine in the divine um, predestinated program. Okay, so let's let's move on to the covenant theology view that the church is not distinct from the nation Israel. In the middle of page twenty-four, covenant theologians use this logic, and you might want to write it down because I didn't have time to put in details here. Okay, a uh, Israel is the seed of Abraham. I'm going to give you three statements here. Israel is the seed of Abraham. The church is the seed of Abraham. Therefore, Israel equals the church. Y'all, y'all understand that? That that reasoning? 
you can prove from the Old Testament that Israel is the seed of Abraham, and the New Testament says the same thing. Okay? You can also prove from Romans that the church is the seed of Abraham. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. You are the seed of Abraham, if you believe. Galatians ch- But they also distinguish is a, Israel is a tie and a tie, and church is a tie. Who? Is, the, the covenant theologian, they, they do not distinguish between, even though they said Israel is church in a sense, in a spiritual sense, but mm-hmm. they also recognize the, the difference because church, Israel is a, a type yeah. Yeah. and church is an Yeah, I, I don't mean to suggest yeah. that covenant theology yeah. says that Israel in the Old Testament is exactly yeah. the same as the church today. They are not full. No, yeah. no. Okay, but but their logic uh, leads them to conclude uh, that that Israel uh, inherits the spiritual blessings of the nation Israel because both are the seed of Abraham. That would be the way they put it. Okay, the church inherits the blessings of spiritual Israel because both are the seed of Abraham. Okay, now if actually. No dispensationalist disagrees with that. We all, dispensationalists have to agree with it because this is what Paul teaches in Galatians and Romans. <laughs> you know, he teaches that we are the seed of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. And so, how can you argue against it? It's there, right? And and there's no need to argue against it. Uh, it's just that there's more to it than that. Okay, so the seed of Abraham logic is is not necessarily false as far as it goes. That's the point. There's nothing wrong with that as far as it goes. Okay? The second argument is from the Abrahamic Covenant. Uh, Genesis 12 was given to physical Jews. Right? That God would, that in you all the nations of the earth would be blessed. You know, through you physical people. Okay? It was going. To, it was going to come through the, the the physical nation. This universal blessing on the world. Okay, and and you can go to Acts, or you can you can go to um, Galatians and other places where it says that the blessing of Abraham has come on the nations. I'll read it. Galatians, chapter three, verse eight. Uh, The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith preached before the Gospels of Abraham, saying, In these shall all nations be blessed. So then, they who are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Down in verse 14, That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So here's the point. Covenant theology argues that the promises through Christ given to Abraham and the nation are fulfilled in the church. That's how they put that. That the promises, the covenant of Abraham is fulfilled in the church. That's their argument. And, again, no problem. I agree with that. You know, because the Bible says it. The, the, The promise of Abraham is fulfilled in the church. Okay? As far as it goes. See? And that's... Paul wasn't talking about all the components of the Abrahamic covenant in Galatians chapter 3. The only one he was talking about was that universal blessing that in thee shall all nations of the world be blessed. What about the land boundary part? What about kings shall come out of you, Abraham? What about you'll have more children than the sand of the sea? You know, uh, that you will have a great name, Abraham, that I'll make you a great man. You know, there were seven or eight or a dozen specific components of the Abrahamic covenant originally given to Abraham and repeated to the patriarchs. And the only one that Paul is talking about is that one, in these should all nations of the earth be blessed. Well, I agree. In, in the church today, that one is being fulfilled. We agree with covenant theologians on this point. There's no problem. The problem is, is that that's as far as they go with it. They would say, now the rest of it doesn't count. The rest of it doesn't count. And that's the problem. This is the er- the great error of covenant theology is that they limit the, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant to this point right here. And that's the only one they take. 
Okay, and they spiritualize, they deny the literalness of all the other ones. Okay? Or they say they were literal and already fulfilled, which is essentially the same argument. But it's impossible for them because the possession of the land has never... If God promised to let you live in that cup forever, and you were in it, and then somebody came along and took you out, and then you got back in and somebody took you out, and then you got back in and somebody took you out, and you're out right now, can you say that you ever, that the promise was ever fulfilled? No, you can't, because you're not in it. God said you were going to live in that cup forever. You see? If you're not in it, then it isn't being fulfilled. I don't care how long you ever were in there for any given period of time. If you're not in there now, it's not fulfilled. You see? And that's the issue regarding the Abrahamic covenant. You know, dispensationalists see that promise of in the land eternally, forever, eternal possession, unbroken possession, has never been. It's obvious in history that it has never been fulfilled because the Jews have never had unbroken eternal possession of the land. They don't have it now. They've never had it in the past. It awaits a future literal fulfillment. You know, as simple as that. And yet, covenant theology says this is the Abrahamic covenant, and this only. Just this point. Okay? And they spiritualize the rest. That's the problem with it. Romans chapter 11, the third point. Paul argues in Romans chapter 11 that you have two trees. Okay, if I can, I'll try to simplify this. Okay, there are two trees. Two olive trees. And uh, there's a, a natural olive tree and a domesticated olive tree. Okay? A natural olive tree is wild and unruly and it produces bad fruit. Okay? It's a domestic tree that is pruned and cared for that produces good fruit. Okay? And so God says that Israel once was this good olive tree. You know, producing all kinds of good fruit and in a wonderful relationship with God. He, God was the pruner, right? Because they rebelled, God cut them off. Because they didn't produce the fruit that he wanted of them. Okay? And instead of the nation Israel being there, then he took a branch off the wild olive tree, which was Gentiles, and he pruned the Gentiles into the good olive tree, and now they're receiving blessing from God in relationship, in the church. Okay? And, and, and he argues that, um, and that's as far as they go. They take that, that analogy right there, and in covenant theology, they just say, look what God has done. He has done away with the nation, and he's grafted the Gentiles, the church, into the same relationship that he once had with the Jewish nation. And we agree with them. There's no, dif there's no disagreement between dispensationalists and covenant theology on that point as far as they go. Because the end of the passage, starting in verse 22, Paul turns it around one step further and says, what if God wants to graft them, the nation, back in? He can do it if he wants. He has the ability. And in fact, he says, blindness now in part has happened to the nation while they're cut off. Right? Until when? The times of the Gentiles is fulfilled, and then the Gentiles are going to be grafted out. They're going to be cut off. The Jews are going to be grafted back into the place of blessing. And so all Israel shall be saved. And he quotes the prophet, Jeremiah, New Covenant, made with the house of Israel and the house of Jacob. You see that? You see that logic? And they, they have to so butcher Romans 11 to sustain this the church is all there is, theology. Okay, that's what they have to do. They just have to make it all the church. Okay, they have to make Israel the church. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. Yeah, and they have to make, and so all Israel shall be saved. What they do is they make that the church. They have to change the definitions, spiritualize. You know, they have to, they have to give the words the wrong meanings. And so we agree with covenant theology as far as they go in the Romans 11 grafting lesson. But if you read it carefully, Paul goes much farther than the covenant theologians do. 
Okay. Number four, the argument based on the covenant people. There's no question that we'll use the new covenant for an example. That Israel is promised in the Old Testament in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I, I think Isaiah refers to the new covenant. That the nation is going to be brought into a new covenant relationship with God. Forgiveness of sins. Right? Forgiveness of sins, a new heart, a new spirit, and a new mind. Right? And that God will be their God and they will be their God's people. Right? The spiritual relationship. God promises the nation that new covenant. You come to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. And the same thing is preached to Christians. Right? That we are in the new covenant. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says we are able, we apostles are able ministers of the new covenant. And so there's a new covenant for Israel, there's a new covenant for the church. They sound almost identical, but the key is the word almost. <laughs> the almost part. There are great similarities. Forgiveness of sins based on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. A relationship with God and his people, right? Brought under the peace of the covenant. The difference is, is that the new covenant is based on the Abrahamic covenant and on the Davidic covenant because they're earthly in the land blessings, restoration to the land, and possession of the land are reiterated in the new covenant to Israel. There are differences there. And so when a covenant theologian comes to those Old Testament passages and says, oh, that's the church, you see, they have to do away somehow with all those other details. They have to do away. I, we read this yesterday in class in Jeremiah 31. He talks about the Goa and Geba and, and specific boundaries in the land as part of the new covenant. That, that is meaningless to the church. It's meaningless to the church. It only has meaning to Israel in the land. You see? And so there are so many... You know, Chang is constantly showing the, the similarities, and there are so many similarities. There is no question. We agree that Israel is the seed of Abraham, church is the seed of Abraham. We agree that these people were grafted in, and so is the church grafted in. We agree that um, uh, they're a covenant people, we're a covenant people. There are all kinds of similarities, but if you look at the passages that talk about these specific subjects... There are subtle differences between them as well as similarities, right? And so the, the, using the argument of the covenant people that we both have a new covenant, uh, they get very loud, loud and emphatic on this, you see? But their argument doesn't hold because the covenant for Israel has land components. The covenant in the New Testament has... No land components for the church. No land. Heavenly place. Galatians chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. We read it already once today. The Israel of God. Um, you can just put a question mark beside it. You know? It's a question mark. Um, I've, I've read the exegetical debates and it gets real complex okay you cannot prove it you know this would make some of you happy galatians chapter 6 verses 15 and 16 doesn't prove it one way or the other you know it's so debated put a question mark beside it don't let anybody don't accept the argument from galatians chapter 6 verse 16 alone that that proves that the church is israel it's just, it's so hotly debated. <laughs> you Jesus know. Christ said, though, okay, when the disciple asked, your mother and your brother came to meet you, right. and said, who is my brother and my, and my mother? The man who believe, who follow, who, who do what I say, means who believe my word, and who follow me. Right. So at that time, he denied the, the physical, the relationship, Right. And he emphasized spiritual relationships. That's right. And, we, so. and I have no problem with that. Dispensationalists believe and accept that teaching too. Right? But what a covenant theologian will do, I don't know if a covenant theologian would do this, but I assume that 
to be consistent, they would take that and they would deny that Jesus has any longer a relationship with his physical nation. You see? Because he turns from his physical family to his spiritual family. You see? And, and this is the big question. If, sure, he does, but what about the physical relationship? In a, in a sense, Jesus Christ, he finished the requirement of the law of Moses. Right. The law of Moses is the foundation of the Israel nation. Right. So he finished our physical line, lineage line, a physical requirement. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, he, as a true Israel, or as a king of Israel, he and who he preached the spiritual gospel across the Israel Palestine, and he said, "I was sent to save the lost of Israel." Actually, he did what he did in in the in the, old, the, the nation Israel, in a sense. So I don't know. I just think about that. <coughs> I don't see as it has much bearing on the discussion. So the resulting definition of the church in covenant theology then is this. The church is spiritual Israel. That's their definition. In covenant theology, the church is spiritual Israel. You have no problem as, as far as it goes. As far as it goes. Yeah. We have no, no any special problem in the sentence. Yeah. Because the Bible yeah. The problem with this view is that um, covenant theology definition of the church really starts with the seed of Abraham logic. You know, well, there were righteous people before Abraham, so why, you know, if the church is the seed is defined as the seed of Abraham, then uh, please explain to us how the church, seed of Abraham, quote unquote, relates to believers prior to Abraham in the days of Noah and back to Abel, you see? There seems to be a... a, 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 sh a there's no, there doesn't appear to be any connection to believers of the prior to Abraham time period. Why would God bother to call out a, a nation, Israel, at a point in history if you know, and, and specifically start his church then, why would he do that then? You know, if he already had righteous people before, and there were righteous people before. Okay? Oh, I think about this. I will talk later. Okay. Uh, why, God called, why God called Abraham right. and make his a nation? Actually, I think about last night to class. Yeah. Here, it's just my opinion. Okay. Yeah, but proved by God. Okay, but the, by far the most difficult problem with the view with the whole covenant theology interpretation of church in Israel is the fact that they have to spiritualize. They have to mistreat specific scriptures back in the Old Testament. Last year, let me illustrate this. Okay, I know I know we've only got about eight minutes left. We've got a lot to cover. But last year I was debating with a guy on the internet about the sacrifice the f sacrificial system in the coming kingdom okay because if you read Isaiah 65 and Zechariah 14 and other passages it sounds like at a face value reading of those prophecies that when Christ comes back to rule on earth that he's going to reinstitute the sacrificial system and that he's going to demand righteous people to come to Jerusalem every year to offer up uh, sacrifices in worship of himself. Okay? Now, these people, covenant theologians, get really angry about that notion. Okay? So I simply said to this man, I said, please turn with me to Zechariah 14, and let's go through it verse by verse. Tell me what you mean, what, how you interpret this verse, and this verse, and this verse, and this verse. Yeah. And Isaiah 65. Okay? And you know something? We got along very well. When we can mostly agree with each other, he and I, when it talks about Christ coming. Because Christ means Christ. Come means come. Uh, earth means earth to earth. Right? Uh, in vengeance and war means vengeance and war. But as soon as you come to 
sacrifices. Click. He doesn't have an interpretation anymore. He has to dream up some other meaning because he doesn't believe <laughs> that A, there's going to be an earthly kingdom, B, that there's going to be a temple and sacrificial system. He believes that that uh, has to be symbolic of heavenly worship, the 24 elders before the throne, casting their crowns before God or something. You see? See what he does? There comes a point where all of a sudden you just can't take it literal anymore. You have to do something else with those words. Okay? Whatever, whatever <laughs> comes up is fine. Okay? That's the big problem here. That's the huge problem facing the covenant theologian. Big problem. Big, 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 big problem. What am I going to do with the words on the page? Okay. Now let's let's move to the dispensational view that the church is distinct from Israel. I want you to notice the overview here. We have three points. Uh, first, the church is has a distinct character from Israel. Secondly, the church is in a distinct time frame. And thirdly, there are many similarities between the church and Israel.